Hello and welcome back to RC Video Reviews. This is the build review of the Value Hobby Skylark S F3A pattern plane. Hey, one thing I forgot to mention during the unbox, the reason I'm searching for a replacement for the Millennium Master is because they discontinued the Millennium Master. When Horizon bought Tower, they have to sanitize their product lineup and one of the casualties of that effort was the Millennium Master. But they also got rid of the Cherokee, the Tower Hobbies Cherokee. They got rid of the, a bunch of great planes, airframes. They got rid of all the foam Mustangs. Horizon really did a number on, on the Tower product line. That's why I have to search for a replacement is because I can't get the Millennium Master anymore. I have one more in the box ready, <laughs> a brand new one in the box uh, that my awesome wife bought me for Christmas. And um, once that one's gone, that's it. That's the last one. So that's why I'm kind of hunting for a replacement. And I, th I still think this plane can be, could, could be that replacement. We'll see. All right, I've got a lot to cover on the Skylark S, but before I get into it, I just want to remind you guys, this is a $70 airplane, and there's a kit version for $40. I think, I'm going to just say it right out front, had I known what I was getting, I would definitely opt for the kit version and use my own hardware. So with that said, let's get into the build review. There's some good, some not so good, but nothing insurmountable or what I would consider to be a deal breaker. I have to roll something back. During the first look video, I said this plane came with a 2217-1100, and I wasn't wrong. That was the label on the motor. The problem is it's one of those deals where the label doesn't indicate the dimensions. I was kind of upset about that, so I wound up taking the motor out, and I measured it. This motor that comes in the plane is actually a 2835-1100, so it is an E450 class motor. So I want to roll that statement back about value and say, well... It's not a bait and switch. Let's just leave it at that. It wasn't a bait and switch. The problem is that the label is one of those goofy labels where they're using numbers that have nothing to do with the dimensions of the can. That said, there are some problems with this motor. The first one is that the shaft was so long. When I first put this together, my back plate was about there. By cutting about four or five millimeters off that shaft, I was able to get the collet pushed back far enough so that the surface of the collet where the prop or the back plate sits now has correct spacing in front of the cowl. You'll also notice there's no back plate or spinner on this. That's because the spinner is trash. It's just, just like all the other plastic spinners, it's just awful. I put it on the plane and it was so out around, it was just ridiculous. Again, the plastic spinners strike again, right? I hate those things. I will be ordering a Dubro aluminum back plate spinner for this plane. The next thing about the motor is that the bearings on this one sound pretty bad. I don't think if there's an imminent failure, but you can just tell quality like the Sunny Sky motors and the Cobra motors and the Tomcat motors against the non-quality motors like this generic 2835 that's in there. The bearings just sound awful. My plan with this plane is just to beat that motor to death and eventually just swap it out for that Turnigy that I that I was talking about in the unbox video and that I also did a judge power test with. So that's the plan. I'm going to switch out the motor for that Turnigy, but I want to run the stock motor so we can get a firsthand flight experience with it. And I want to report that back to the channel. That's the only reason that motor is still in there. I do not like the way the bearings in that motor sound at all. Another thing I want to show you, and, and this is another reason where I say I'd, I would probably just buy my own hardware on the next iteration. That is the prop nut that came with the motor. And all I did was I stuck a wrench through there, a hex driver, stuck it through there and tightened it on, and it just popped right off. I mean, that cone just broke clean off. And you can tell this wasn't because I monkey fisted it. I don't know if I'll be able to get this so you can see it. But if you can see that, that's the tip that broke off. All that is is a very badly placed hole on this prop nut. With just the slightest amount of pressure, it's sheared right off. Thankfully, I have spares, but if you don't have spares, be aware of that. Be aware of it, because that, that thing was terrible. I have a prop nut on there from my, my spare kit uh, right there, and that one, you know, I was able to wrench that on without any problems. 
Okay, so on the motor, the way I'm looking at this, worst case scenario is that I swap it out. And I, I went and looked. These motors are about 15 bucks. The spinner with the aluminum backplate, about eight. So you're looking at about $23 worth of corrections. That's why I say if I had this to do again, I would definitely buy the kit version and not the PNP. Because why? Why waste the money on that motor and that spinner and that backplate and that prop nut if none of them are usable? I will fly it with this just so we can see what the motor does, but I don't really, I don't like the sound of the motor. So I, I'm absolutely going to change that out and I'll be using either a Turnigy or maybe an SK3 or something else. Moral of the story is you're about $23 in for replacement parts. So start with the kit at 40 bucks and add your own motor and you'll be in much better shape. Okay, regarding the rest of the hardware, the servos seem to be fine. I had one wing servo that had a servo horn was just off by one tooth. So I had to take the screw out and move the horn with everything still in the wing. It wasn't that big of a deal. It seems like we're having problems with metal on this plane. That tail wheel is also out of my stock. And the reason it's out of my stock is because after I had everything set up and everything centered, I noticed the tail wheel wasn't in alignment with the rudder. The tail wheel is kind of torqued a little bit like that. So I took a pair of pliers and I just kind of bent it and the thing snapped right at the 90 degree point. It just snapped like that. Real brittle metal. I'm kind of glad it snapped on the bench because that tells me if it hadn't, it probably would have snapped while flying or landing. I just took something out of my stock that's a little bit more pliable, a little better, and I, I fit it to the, to the airframe. If you stick with the one that comes from the, from the box, just be aware, be gentle if you have to bend it and pay real close attention where it turns that 90 degree bend. Don't put any tension on that bend at all because it will snap. The next thing I want to cover is the main landing gear. I don't really fundamentally object to the way they handled the installation of the mains. What they did is the main go into a, a wooden slot that's in here on the, on the belly of the plane. And then there's this little wood key that slides in and then you put a screw going like that through the, through the pocket and then the key and then the back side of the pocket. The first time I assembled the gear, that worked just fine. But I had to take the gear apart and, and I switched them because you'll notice that I have the rake angle backwards. And I did that because normally you rake the gear forward. On a tail dragger, the normal thing to do is to rake the gear forward. But I went, there was no guidance in the instructions about it. I didn't really see much in terms of pictures about it. So I went and looked at the Airborne Models Wings Maker series, and they have a plane called the Sunrise that's almost identical to this. And they did have some good pictures showing the gear raked back. I took the gear out, flipped everything around, and while I was working on getting the gear pressed back down into the pocket and getting my key in, two of the holes snapped clean off. I mean, it just clean off. What I did instead was I took the key out, put a, just a little bit of glue on there, I put the gear in, put the key in, and I smeared some hot glue across the top, and then I covered it with this fiber tape. The good news is there's no real load coming down from here, right? That key, all that key does is, is just holds the gear in. It's not a big deal. I think this arrangement will be fine with the tape. Just be aware, I, I had a little bit of a problem down there with the, with the wood. It, that little keyhole snapped off, and it snapped off so easily, it kind of made me think maybe it was a good idea that I found that. Otherwise, it would be my luck, I'd be walking out in the field to find my landing gear. Okay, during the unbox, I mentioned that I did not like the idea how they wanted you to use an O-ring on these wing T-sticks. And Air Hammer chimed in, he said, hey man, why don't you just put a block down there, glue it in and screw your T-sticks in. And that's exactly what I did. So I, all I did was I got a piece of plywood that's the same thickness as these T-sticks and the same width of these T-sticks. And I just cut it to fit in between the two fuselage halves. And I just slid, I actually slid it in from the side. I slid it in from the side. And then once I got the wings in, drilled a hole, and then I just ran a little screw right there in, in on both sides. So that T-stick has a screw, that T-stick has a screw. And now if I want to, I can take the wings off. So big shout out to Air Hammer. That's one of the cool things about this community is you look at something and you're like, well, I don't know how I'm gonna deal with that. And somebody else looks at it and they instantly come up with a really good idea. And then what's cool is when they share it. So Air Hammer, big shout out to you, my friend. Thanks for telling me about that one. It worked like a champ. Good idea. I'm glad I did it that way. And, and now if I want to, I can take the wings off. That's a win-win. All right, one other thing that Air Hammer mentioned, he said talking about this plane, you know, being a $70 plane with a little bit of tinkering, you can get it dialed right in. He mentioned the idea of putting a spar in on the horizontal stabilizer and I just wanted to point out there is a spar in there already so you don't even need to do that it comes with one and it is actually pretty rigid I mean 
that's not bad. That's pretty rigid. So I'm, I'm satisfied with that the way it comes out of the box. So no real reason to take that extra step. Next up, let's talk a little bit about these control horns. The funny thing is on Value Hobby's website, they mention on the product listing that you might want to use higher quality hardware like control horns. I got to be honest though, I didn't have any problems with these control horns. The only issue is that these, the EPO is molded for those control horns that have two pins that go through. And the ones they send you in the kit are the ones that are more like a single blade going through. So all I did was I just took my razor knife and right in between those two holes, I just made a small little slit all the way through. And then I poked my control horn through and it was fine. Don't forget to use the glue, use some foam glue on that. And then I also put a little dab of glue on the top to seal these caps on the top of all the uh, blades, you know, the control horn blades when they pop through. And that's it, that, that's it. I don't have any fear running the plane like that. No big deal. So I'm not sure why, maybe they had some complaints. I don't know, but as far as I'm concerned, the control horns are just fine. I don't have any issues with the control horns. This doesn't come with any fuel tubing, so you want to make sure you get your own fuel tubing and cut it and put it on all your control surfaces. So you can see I did it on my ailerons, there and there, and then also on the rear control surfaces for the elevator and for, let me see that, the rudder right there. Okay, one other thing I really need to make sure that I point out is that the routing for the motor wires is not great. The wires run down here on this plate and they're real easy to get caught up on this motor. So what I did is I pushed all my excess back down up front and then I used a zip tie. I think ultimately what I do when I put my permanent motor in here is that I will spend the time fishing the wires down and running them back underneath the plate so they come out up here uh, and connect to the ESE. I couldn't do it this time because these wires were just a little bit too short. So the only way I could have done it would be to build extensions on the motor and that because I knew this was going to be kind of a part-time motor I didn't bother with that so just be aware I would advise against leaving the motor wires just sitting there below the motor without doing something to secure them if you don't I would almost guarantee you're going to wind up getting something caught and having your motor rip your wires right off your ESC motor all I can say is that motor wire routing was very annoying um, there's got to be a better way to do it I almost kind of wish they would have left that battery tray off and let us glue it in after we arranged our motor wires and ESC the way we wanted to. That would have been nice. Regarding the motor, I did a power test on this and the motor peaks around 230, 240 watts, somewhere in that neck of the woods running the, this is a nine by six slow fly prop. You notice that's not what I have on there. I've got a 10 six standard prop on there and um, I'm getting about the same amperage between the two. I'll mess with them both and see which one I like. I plan on bringing both to the field and trying them both out to see which one I like the best. But they're both balanced and ready to go. And I will be running this with 3S. This is a 1.67 pound plane. That puts me right at about 150 watts per pound. It's very close. And then the last thing I've got is the CG. I don't know what the deal is with this particular plane on YouTube, but the flight videos that I've seen or the build reviews, they're not, they're not very detailed. So I saw one video where a guy flew this plane and he said exactly what his CG was specifically. He said that he tried what the book recommended. It came out way too tail heavy for that. The book says to put the CG at 110 centimeters, which puts it back here. And I personally, I think that's crazy. It might there. Now you can see where my finger is in relation to the rest of the wing. Putting it back there to me is just crazy. The guy that flew the plane and said that he experimented with CG and he found the best that worked for him was putting it 95 centimeters. So that's where I'm going. And that to me looks like pushing 30 to 40% of the wing cord. I'm gonna try 95, but I'm gonna be very sensitive on takeoff for tail heavy, a tail heavy situation. But anyway, the book, yeah, the book says 110 and I just think that looks way, way too far back for me. And from what I can tell reading RC Group's threads on it, there are several different opinions, but I couldn't find a real consensus. I'll keep you guys updated and after the maiden, I'll let you know what adjustments I make. I did notice one other little thing that I didn't catch during the unbox and that's the decals. If you look, the decals on this side, the flags go up into the red and on this side, they're not even close. So those are off just a little bit. That's a nitpick, it's just a nitpick. You'd really have to be paying attention to see that. And I think your friends at the field would really have to be paying attention to see that as well. So that's just a little bit of a nitpick, no, not a big deal. 
All right, so the next thing to do will be to maiden it, and that will tell the rest of the story. And I think I have a feeling if it maidens well with a little bit of motor tuning, and I'm going to forgive this because I could have bought the $40 kit, and if I ever buy another one of these again, I will buy a $40 kit, and I'll put my own motor in it. And with that, that makes this a very compelling airplane because I'll be in it for about $75 with my choice of motors, and as long as this thing flies well, it could be that daily beater of plane that goes with me every time I go to the field. We'll see. Jury's still out. The flight test will tell the story. All right, that's all I've got on the build review, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing. Your subscription is very meaningful. And if you are a subscriber, don't forget to hit that notification bell. And do me a favor, keep the comments coming. I appreciate the conversation. I like your points of view. I like talking about the hobby with you guys. The comments help too. They help with placement. So keep the comments coming. And that's all I've got for tonight. So be on the lookout for the maiden and have a great night. Take it easy.